Oh, hello, how is everybody doing? It's almost the end of the day. As they like to say in the Netherlands, we're almost at borrow time. You know, we're going to go have some drinks, have some chats, but a couple more presentations left at this point. So first, before I get started, I have a question for everyone. So you can just raise your hand, you can stand up enthusiastically, you can shout out, but who here has ever played a game? Pretty much everybody, huh? Homework assignment, talk to the person to your left or right and ask them what that favorite game that they've ever played is. You can do that also now, side to side, after the talk. But we all know what games are. <laughs> we've all played them. They've all had a different type of impact on us in our lives. But what is gamification then? Another hands up. Who's heard of gamification? Okay, also pretty much everybody. Who here has used a product that has claimed to gamify something? And just for curiosity, who thinks gamification is good? Who thinks gamification is bad? Who doesn't really care and they just kind of want to know what it is before <laughs> making an opinion up? About a bit of a mix there. All right, so without further ado, and sorry, I'll be looking behind me a little bit now. So what is gamification? Well, a lot of times when we hear about gamification, it's in this term as though it's this magical quick win. It's this super easy power. All we have to do is take these mechanics from games and boom, sprinkle them everywhere and poof, we're going to have, like a cheat code, an absolutely magical motivation power up. Yes! But is that, is that really the case? Like, is this really what gamification should be about? You know, do game mechanics actually work like that? That a leaderboard somehow is going to change our behavior so dramatically and so blindly? And would we even want that for design? Well, I want to take a step back and talk about games before we move into gamification. And I think this is what the gamification movement started with, was an observation that games are really good at engaging us. They're really good at motivating us and explaining, thing to, explaining things to us in ways we rarely see in other applications. So what is a game? Many definitions out there, as this is not an academic setting, we won't get into a, a semantics discussion on this, but I like this example because it's very clear. Four things. Games have goals, games have rules, Games have a feedback system, and perhaps, most importantly, they're voluntary. They tend not to have real-world consequences, as you might say. So if we think about what that means, if games are all those four things, what this really means is that games are complex, or not complex in some case, systems. So what's a system, then? We've talked about design systems today, so we're a bit familiar with that, but I want to look at this more from a system in terms of interacting pieces. That's not necessarily a design system, but it is looking at games and design as we are system designers. So not more components, but higher level UX. So systems are sets of interacting elements that work together according to set rules to achieve a common goal. This is an example of a system. It doesn't just have to be digital systems. This is also a system. And yes, school is also a system. Systems are all around us, and they've existed long before we've looked at gamification. You could call a school system the gamification of education. But is it? I mean, it's, is it a game, really? <laughs> is it just the fact that we have a system that we've created to try to help people understand something better? I would call it more that latter. And this is an example of a common game. I think most of you have... Who has played Mario here at some point in time in their life? Very nice, I approve. You will see a lot of Mario in this presentation, so I'm happy for that, and maybe one or two other franchises. But Mario seems kind of simple, we're looking here. But if we actually look at it, there's a lot of things going on in this game. There's a lot of pieces. We, we have to learn about things that are going to help us, things that can hurt us, about what the physics are, how can we move around in the world, where is even the world, how many worlds are there, what are we even doing here, what do we have to do. There's actually a lot of things going on in this very simple looking game because it's a complex system. 
And you might say, okay, yeah, but how do we start to learn about these different things? Well, this is what games are really good at. They're good at giving us feedback systems that we're not looking at the computer being like, oh my gosh, how do I get anywhere in this? But rather, whoop, but rather they give us indications up here, potentially, if technology will work a little bit. I, I don't know why it doesn't want me to land on that slide. But anyways, Mario, you have coins, you have levels, you have world navigations. And these are the things we think of with game mechanics and game narrative that help us start to understand all those complex things. And that's really what the magics of games are. Because in many cases, games are really good at telling stories because stories are everywhere. And what they do is they take all those complicated mechanics and they package it into, uh, uh, basically, they try to tell a story using these complex mechanics to give people a way to in, engage, involve, and learn in the world. To move quickly forward again. So why are stories so important when we look at UX and look at games? Well, that's because the way that our brain processes and learn is really different when we're thinking about stories than if we're thinking about things just like bullet points. Because when you're reading bullet points or text, only the language processing part of your brain is active. While on the other hand, when you're listening to a story, the parts of your brain that are used to experience a story actually become active as well. So it becomes much easier for us to understand complex topics when we're not just reading a bullet point list, but rather we're listening to a story, or even better, like in games in many cases, engaging with that story. So what is then gamification to come back to that? It's understanding that we are building systems as designers and using a similar approach as games to try to make these systems more understandable, more relatable, and more motivational. Your note, I didn't say to try to make them more fun or to more obscure things or to try to trick people into doing anything or to try to just add layer after layer of unnecessary <laughs> additions to try to get people to have engagement, and we'll talk about that in a second but it's understanding that this is what we all do every day, every product, everything everywhere. Everything's a system. But we can learn from games on how to make systems easier to access and how to help people understand, navigate, and enjoy their experience in a system. Because using fun to hide reality, it's not going to actually create behavior change. So a lot of times when people are coming and they're like, okay, hey, um, we need some more engagement in this app, or, you know, people aren't coming back, how do we do this? They tend to look at gamification because they think, ah, yes, fun. People will do anything for fun. But okay, let's even say you build something super, super fun that's maybe on that borderline, not so ethical thing. It's still not going to create behavior change because they don't understand your system. They don't understand what you're trying to get them to do. They don't understand why it's good or bad for them. They just understand that they come somewhere and something nice happens and okay, that's it. And I think that that's where a huge misconception about gamification is, is that it's not just about pretty animations. It's not, you can't just add a badge. The badge needs to mean something in the system. It needs to mean something to people. So using fun to hide reality by creating an artificial layer that doesn't really show your intentions, it's not going to help. You should really use gamification to make it more understandable and accessible. I won't go through all of these things in the next couple slides because to go through each of them, we would have to have a workshop and it would be a much longer talk. But I want to try to break it down a little bit into three ways to start thinking about system design as a game designer. So whenever you get started, you should really think about, okay, especially when you're building a product that may already have a functional system in the real world already, so we're not creating an entertainment narrative necessarily, you want to think about, okay, like, what am I setting out here to do? What are the goals of this product? What do I want to try to help people do? Or what do I want to try to accomplish myself? You should think about who are the stakeholders in your project? Who are the stakeholders in the system? You know, what information do I know about them? Or do I want to try to collect from them? Or what do I feel like I already might have? What's the environment they live in? How can they move around in it? You know, is it a single flow where nobody can really have any say over what happens? Or is it more of an ecosystem of which people can make different choices and have different outcomes? You know, what's allowed, what's not allowed? What can people do, what can't they do? What inputs might they give us and what outputs might we give them back? 
because once you start thinking about all these things, you start to see the world that you're working with. To give an example, the stock market is a system. Some of you may be familiar <laughs> with what happened with GameStop. Who, did anybody follow that too much? No, not so much? All right, so for a short intro into that is basically what happened with the GameStop uh, stock is that a whole bunch of people who wanted to shake up the system a little bit in a <laughs> relatively entertaining way kind of crashed the stock market for a little while by being able to easily buy GameStop stock and basically increase the valuation of that stock very artificially. Now, it caused a lot of disruption in the stock market and to go into fintech and gamification and whether or not that should have been allowed to happen or is a completely different topic. But this is an example of, you know, they were able to be successful in making a system more accessible for people. They took down a lot of traditional barriers in what people would have to do in order to be able to trade on the stock market. And so, again, ethical aspects of that is a little bit of a different topic, but because they understood all of these different components, they were able to build an experience that understood the system, build an experience on top of that system, and allow a bit of chaos to happen maybe, but at the same time to allow a lot more people to engage in something that they couldn't previously do. Once you kind of know what your system is and what it is that you want to accomplish with it, then you get into more of the story. And this is where you start to think about it more, just like you would in game design, about, okay, what type of feedback do we want to give people? You know, how are we going to let them modify this existing system? What are we going to do to maybe allow them to play and have failure? That's a big component of games. No one plays Mario perfectly from day one. You try, you fail, and you don't figure it out, and then you try again and you can continue. That's why games are good at teaching. Are we going to allow that in this? Can we allow that in this? What's rewarded in the system versus what's punished in the system? Where are you going to give somebody a benefit or say, hey, good job, or give them a point, versus where are you going to show a negative feedback so that they understand, okay, this wasn't what we wanted you to do in the system, or something has actually happened. And also, it's really important to think about what terminology you're using. How are you talking to the user? How are you talking to the player? And what is that whole story? What's this big picture? Why should somebody care about the product or service that you're bringing to life through this? Now, why can this matter is, so let's take an example with carpooling. This is actually based on a project that uh, I was hired to consult on uh, down a couple years ago. So they had a goal. They wanted to get less cars on the ro road. They wanted to get more passengers, therefore, in the car at this place of operation. So they decided to start off by rewarding drivers who have passengers. They're like, all right, this will be great. We're going to make a leaderboard. We're going to have badges. We're going to give good things to people who have more passengers in their car. Sounds good, right? You use gamification, leaderboards, badges. But there was a bit of an issue, because they weren't looking at it thoroughly through the system and looking at all the stakeholders. It's actually what they also needed is they needed passengers. They built a system that was too biased towards drivers, so they created a shortage of what they actually needed, which is more people willing to not take their car, rather than more people having to go out and somehow trying to get people to ride with them. So when you don't think through how all these pieces are interacting necessarily, when you start to look at gamification or look at these feedback systems, you can actually end up creating a system that's detrimental to what you originally set out to do. And it's also really important to keep negative feedback in. This is something I also see a lot with gamification projects, is people tend to take negative feedback out and only have positive things in. Like, okay, hey, good job. You're doing great. This is going fantastically. But in games, negative feedback is a crucial part of understanding the system. It's a crucial part of learning, because it's through that failure or through something not going the right way that people really understand what's going on. Third, mechanics. And this is where a lot of people have what they think about gamification, things like points and data, currency, challenges, badges, these are the artificial things you build on top of that different layer. So you have your original system that you're trying to work with, you have that secondary one which you're trying to focus people on a certain aspect of that system, and then you can get to the, all the different ways of which you might introduce language around that. Like by adding a small currency in order to show people what's a more valuable behavior or what's a less valuable behavior. Or by having challenges to try to keep people focused on something specific. 
that challenge may not exist naturally in your original system, but by trying to focus them by saying, okay, you should set out to do this and we're going to reward you with different things, you're going to potentially have a chance to incur that behavior. But keep in mind, if none of these things have meaning to people, if they don't understand why they're doing this in the system, if they don't understand why you're giving them a badge, if they don't care about a digital badge that doesn't really do much for them, you can put these things in all day long, but it won't actually help. These should just be tools to make it easier for you to explain to people what it is you want them to do and how their system act your system actually works. For example, let's take a mechanic like walking. So you're going to see in two different apps, as you already saw, Pokemon Go is another one. But how Nike uses data about running and the way that they build gamification in around that is different than how, for example, Pokemon Go uses walking in their gamification. Technically, both of them use walking, but the narrative here is super different than the narrative here. Uh, I clearly am not, <laughs> I'm not good enough to operate the clicker. I failed this test. I, I will uh, have to prepare for the next level redo on that. Uh, but the fact that they both use walking, and a lot of times people say that Pokemon Go is the, ga is the gamification of walking, the thing is, the goal of Pokemon Go wasn't necessarily to get people to walk. This is just a mechanic of Pokemon. In Pokemon, you walk around, you collect things, you uh, collect Pokemon, you battle Pokemon. So here, walking was just a way to immerse you in the story more, that it made it more engaging, it made it more fun to do, rather than building this entire game world around the concept of running more, which is what, for example, Nike's more focused on. And to get to the ethics aspect of it is, it's always important to remember that there's going to be intention and bias behind your system or your product. There's no way to avoid it because in many cases you're designing what you think is right and what you think is wrong. What you want to reward and what you don't. What you want to explain and what you might leave out. And so whenever we start a project, again, especially if we're thinking about using gamification and trying to use some of those dopamine hits to try to help people feel more motivated or feel happier about a process, we need to make sure what our intention actually is. Because you should be clear on whose objective you're honestly designing for. Are you really designing for your user and that's why you're using gamification and game mechanics and narrative and trying to make this more accessible? Or are you potentially maybe using some of these tricks to just help get what you want, which is maybe in this case, this is booking.com for example, you can see a lot of urgency, limited time deal, only one left at this price, you know, urgency, price reduced, there's a lot of urgency there. Now is this really something that's necessary for the user to know in order to have the value given to them by booking.com? Or is this something that, okay, is maybe just to try to get you to buy then immediately and get triggered by fear rather than actually taking maybe extra time that you want to do? Second, don't get derailed designing for untethered vanity metrics. And what I mean by this is a lot of times I see people start to use gamification because what they really want is daily engagement. And so many projects I've seen have not been successful or have failed because people get so stuck on trying to get people back every single day that they're not thinking about how this actually fits into somebody's normal routine. They're not thinking about the actual behavior change that has to happen. They're so focused on building all of these extra features in order to get someone to keep coming back and keep engaging that they're not thinking actually about, okay, are we actually providing this value? And is daily engagement the best way to provide this value? Because, yeah, you shouldn't try to force daily engagement. All of us, we have about four to six hours of focused attention every day. We can't give all of that engagement to every single app that crosses our path. And I know it's tempting because it's a great KPI to say, oh, people are coming back and looking at the app and, and engaging every day. But at the same time, you know, it's just because of the fact we could maybe design components that are going to trigger people to want to come back, you know, that may not be the most ethical approach. We may be able to do it. You know, we may be able to put the indefinite scroll in there and have people continuously looking. But as designers, and especially if we're looking to try to increase engagement, we should always be asking ourselves, is this really necessary? And is this really the right thing to do? Are we really out there to help people? Or are we really just out there to try to push our own agenda? And finally, is take the time to understand your unique world and playtest. 
This is one of the biggest lessons I think we can take also from games, is that games play test all the time. You have to, because it's a system. You can't run through every scenario. You can't run through how people are going to use it. So by taking time to really get out there and let people experiment with it, do paper, paper prototyping, but really understand how these features are going to work together and how people may think about the way that your features work together, it's going to make your design much more successful in the end because you will see how real people interact with those with these systems. Because a lot of times what's actually then magic, it's maybe not so much a game mechanic like leaderboard, but it's spending much more time on something than anyone else might reasonably expect. And by taking the time to actually start with the first system part before you get into gamification and make sure each step of the way you know what you're trying to set out to do and that you're using these mechanics in a way that's going to fulfill that, you're going to have a lot more success ultimately than if you just plop a leaderboard in or plop badges in and, and hope for the best. And it's also going to be more ethical because you've actually thought it through and you've asked yourself questions on why you're doing what you're doing instead of just trying to get that quick, easy win that maybe everybody looks for a little bit at the beginning. Thank you.